So I know I can come across as sarcastic in a lot of my responses to people's comments, and uh, that isn't to be spiteful or mean or anything. I just find it fun to mess with people. But in all uh, seriousness, I do actually enjoy getting comments from people and responding to comments and seeing how the conversations evolve from those comments. Uh, case in point, I actually got a comment from BenRex777, who just in passing mentioned that he wanted to recreate the AVR microcontroller in Minecraft, which I thought was great because that was actually one of the first microcontrollers that I was introduced to. Is also one of the ones that inspired me to get into a lot of this stuff. So hearing that he wanted to recreate the AVR microcontroller uh, was actually pretty cool. Uh, one of the things that he had mentioned, though, is he wanted a different way of programming it. Most computers in Minecraft have to be programmed in machine code, uh, mainly because we have access directly to the memory, uh, but there's not a good way of parsing text in, in the game. You could, of course, you know, you can type, but there's no way of parsing it. There's no way of getting that information out of the text. Uh, but he had thrown some ideas out there, saying that he wanted to use either books or blocks of some kind. Um, and as soon as he mentioned that, that actually got me thinking, because I had never thought about making a compiler uh, in-game. Of course, I have seen people create external compilers. Uh, Lawrence Wayne, with his Commandor 32 computer, was actually a good example of this. He created an external uh, compiler that compiled... Uh, written code and convert it into machine code which was loaded through the commands uh, and that worked pretty well but an in-game compiler I thought would be kind of interesting so I ran it by Benrex see if it was alright if I ran with that idea he thought it was pretty cool so I figured I'd give it a try here uh, and then I figured I'd start with uh, just the infrastructure because obviously you can't compile something unless you have something to compile so the first thing I did was I actually created uh, a resource pack to convert a couple picked blocks into letters. <laughs> so now we have a nice big wall of text, uh, each block representing a single letter, and of course I can use these for multiple purposes. Uh, one of them, of course, being a keyboard layout. Obviously this is all lowercase, but we can, of course, make a second one with the uppercase. Uh, I'm still trying to work out the layout. Um, because punctuation might make things a little bit bulky. I might just have to swap letters with punctuation. Uh, also, me have noticed that the textures aren't perfect. Obviously, the three seems to be a little bit higher than everything else. Uh, I did my best to try and make everything as uniform as possible, but you can only do so much in a 16 by 16 pixel area. So, yeah. Um, like I said, these will serve multiple purposes. One, of course, being the physical keyboard. Uh, and I don't have to put... You know, you may think, oh, I'm going to turn this into a keyboard by throwing buttons on there, but I actually don't have to do that um, because trap doors, when turned transparent, actually make for a pretty good button. <laughs> um, they're a little bit difficult to, to uh, catch when they're open, uh, so I'll have to have some sort of mechanism to close that when, it, when it's opened. Uh, but this means that we get a nice transparent button. We basically turn the whole block into a button. And this is actually a trick that I used in my Five Nights at Freddy's map. I found it works pretty well. Um, and if you measure a uh, player's position and rotation, you can actually get some pretty precise um, control, which means you can actually turn a single block into multiple buttons. Uh, but that's besides the point. Uh, so I can use these blocks to actually create a keyboard using the blocks and the trap doors, but I can also use them to create uh, walls of text, so I figured we'd probably have like a text editor uh, type window somewhere over here uh, with just a bunch of these blocks stacked on top of each other to actually create our text. Uh, but then the third purpose uh, for these uh, would actually be for tokenizing and parsing, uh, because uh, ultimately, when it comes to the tokenization process, we we need text to actually tokenize. And so I figured rather than having armor stands or something or, you know, something that's really big and bulky, we may as well just use the text that's on the screen itself. So I figured the tokenization process could actually involve just taking these blocks and running them through a state machine. Uh, I've actually been experimenting with that in Python, trying to see if that would work and how well that would work. And so far, it seems to work pretty well. Uh, but we can't jump the gun just yet. We have to give ourselves a proper environment to work on. So I figured the first thing I would work on is the text editor. 
Turning the resource pack back off for just a moment, I've already got some sort of a keyboard layout type here. In fact, if I were to actually turn the resource pack back on, you can see what this looks like. Give it a second. Uh, so I just went with a, uh, the standard QWERTY keyboard layout right down to the punctuation location. And the reason why is because I was sitting here trying to figure out how to place all the punctuation in a nice, neat uh, format that uh, seemed fairly intuitive and compact. Couldn't figure it out, so I figured why try to reinvent the wheel when I could just work with what already exists. Somebody's already figured this out. So this is just your standard QWERTY layout. Punctuation is as where it should be. Um, this is your lowercase layout. This is your shifted or uppercase layout. Um, so we have in place of the numbers, some of the punctuation, other bits of punctuation has changed like that. Uh, that's the period and comma. Now it's the angle brackets, uh, things like that. Uh, but then to see the rest, we gotta have to kind of have to turn that off. Um, but yeah, to actually get the keyboard to interact or to be able to interact with the keyboard, we need to be able to tell when the player's pressing a button. So like I said, I was going to use trap doors, um, and this is what I got. You can push a trap door, and it will close the trap door. And the way that works is actually fairly simple. We have a wall of trap doors right here. Uh, this both serves as the template that is copied over when a trapdoor is open, it also is used to tell when a trapdoor has been opened uh, because we're using an execute command uh, right here to test for the blocks in that in that area, compare it to this area, and if it does not match, that's what the unless is for. Uh, if it does not match, then the condition passes and all of these commands are executed. Right now they're empty. Uh, the only one that's got anything is this one, and this just clones the the trap door is over. So it's really not that complicated. You click a trap door, uh, these no longer match, the condition is met, and it clones it back over. So this serves as a nice uh, way of detecting when the player clicks something. Now we just need to be able to tell what it is they're clicking. And I figure the easiest way to do that is when the trap door has been opened, this is already activating. So I think somewhere in here I'll have to set up a mechanism to I figure the easiest way to do it is to just spawn a bunch of armor stands, have them scan across the entire keyboard, and then just clone the block that's next to them uh, if the trap door is open. So I think that's what I'm going to implement next. And progress has been made. Took a little bit of uh, finicking, apparently, these uh, conditional commands. Uh, anything down the line from a conditional command, even if the condition was not met, will still execute. It's kind of weird, so I had to do some really weird trickery. Uh, with setting the auto data on command blocks to get this to work. Uh, but ultimately what I've managed to do is uh, use this as sort of the detection mechanism for the trapdoors and all of this for the scanner. So now we actually have a means of scanning for which character was selected. And of course the nice thing about this particular format is it's super easy to do, doesn't take too terribly many commands, and it's super configurable. So um, I can actually switch the keyboard layout super easy like and it still works just the same um obviously there's still a little you know a lot of work to do but you know so far so good not too terribly shabby if i do say so myself so i think the next part in all of this is uh well now that we can actually detect what characters we're pressing we need to somehow store them and display them on some display that i haven't decided where it's going to go yet. I, I was considering putting it here, but I feel like this is a little bit too sharp of an angle. Over there just seems kind of odd, likewise with over there. So I'm really not certain, uh, but we'll see what comes of it when we get to that point. But for the time being, uh, the next step in this is just to get the block that we've selected somewhere else. No wait, I lied. There's one more thing I wanted to add to this keyboard before we get to the screen. Uh, obviously, there's a couple extra characters around the keyboard uh, that don't pertain to characters such as uh, these along here. Uh, and what these are are basically function keys um, because everything is going to be done through the keyboard. That includes typing, but we'll also need to be able to edit text. So that means things like backspacing, selecting, inserting, moving the cursor, uh, and escaping to actually run the code. Um, and, and of course, caps lock. So um, basically what we need to do is make sure that the keyboard doesn't push these into the text string thinking that they're characters, uh, which is what all of this stuff does. So 
if you press any character that's not any of these, this line of commands will actually trigger. Right now all it does is just tell you that it's been triggered, but it will do some, something eventually. Um, so any key that you press, it will just tell you process character, uh, which means it'll push that character onto the screen. However, if you were to push something that is one of those reserved bits, it will give you a different message indicating that it's going to execute whatever command blocks have gotten that line. Right now all they do is they just tell you that you've pressed that key, uh, but eventually they will serve functions in the editor. So like I said, this will move characters. This is for selecting, inserting, backspace. Um, and then the upper slash cap slash lower, these uh, obviously don't do anything for the editor. They're actually for the keyboard. This allows me to toggle the caps. Uh, and so you'll notice I actually had to press that three times. That's because if you press the upper, um, you can press a key and the whole keyboard goes back to lower. Press it twice, however, now you're in caps lock and you can press upper keys all day till the cows come home and it's not going to go back to lower until you press low again. So that was just a feature that I wanted to add. Uh, but now that that is all in place and we got all that figured out, now we can get to the part where we actually move these characters onto a screen. Well, it's a small step in the right direction, but it is a step. I've added a few more command blocks uh, and I've also added a screen. I've decided to put the screen here because this seems like the less um, odd angle. I, I guess it's not too big of a deal to move your head over like that to uh, look at something. Uh, ideally, I'd have the screen somewhere around the keyboard so you can see whilst you're typing, but uh, this is Minecraft. You can only get so much. Uh, but nonetheless, we have a screen there, and at this point, it's basically just a big blank canvas, um, but eventually we'll try and get characters to go across there. And right now, there there is no function to actually get characters across the screen. That's because everything that I've got going on over here is actually all for this. So I'm actually storing the string in, um, in a line going from here all the way down to the other side. You can see that other uh, pillar of redstone blocks. There's two of those. Uh, and they're, they've each got a diamond block on this one. It's on the bottom. All the way over there, over there if you can see that, it's actually at the top. And the reason why is because these di uh, redstone blocks I'm actually using to act as sort of a barrier, sort of a, an edge delimiter, d delimiter, something like that. Um, so the cursor, uh, anytime it encounters a redstone block, knows it needs to cycle over, whether it's going that way or coming back. And the diamond blocks acts as a total stop. Uh, the end of file also acts as a stop, but that's sort of a stop between the stops. Uh, once it gets to the diamond block, you cannot add any more characters. So this is just a way of uh, limiting the size of the text. It's still a pretty large area. Uh, it's 192 blocks long, 16 blocks tall. It's about 4,000 characters in total. So it's pretty pretty decent sized. Uh, but we're storing the string here, and then the plan is to actually have a separate process for copying the string from... Uh, or sections of the string from the main string to the screen. And the reason why is because, one, this will make parsing easier later on down the line, and two, uh, I intend on having scroll features and stuff like this. So this means that we can have text that's larger than the actual area that we're working with. Uh, like I said, this is about 4,000 characters. This one's, I think, only about uh, 200, 250. So uh, we can actually write a lot more than we can display on the screen by doing it this way. Uh, but I've, all of this stuff is for editing the string that's down there. So if I go ahead and type out the classic hello world, uh, now we have a nice string that we can work with, starting with, you know, hello world and then ending with an end of file, which is where the cursor currently sits. If I want to backspace, I simply hit backspace and the last character at the end of the string will be deleted. You can see that there was an exclamation point before the end of file. Now there is not. I'll even do it again just to prove to you. In fact, I'll try and get it so that the cursor's on screen whilst I do it. There you go. And now the D is missing. Uh, not only that, but we also have cursor shifting. Uh, so right now we don't have up and down because that's mainly for the screen, for scrolling. But we do have left and right, so if I go left a couple times, uh, you can see that the cursor has moved. We're now above the W. Uh, and the way I've set this up is shifting or adding characters and removing characters is actually done by a shifter. So 
because of uh, because I did it like that, I can actually add characters uh, anywhere I want. So uh, right now the cursor is right there. If I were to start typing in some gibberish, we can actually go back to the screen and we can see that uh, that gibberish has been inserted before the world or whirl in this case. Uh, and of course we can backspace that out as well. The backspace works inside a character too. Just like that. And that's pretty much all I got so far. I mean, it's um, there's still a couple more features that I want to add, of course. Uh, like I do want to add um, replacing instead of inserting, because right now the keyboard just kind of inserts text when you put the cursor in the middle. I do want to add the function to actually toggle to just uh, right over instead of insert, so that's what this key will do eventually. But for the time being, this is a good starting point. And the next step, of course, will be to wrap up some of these functions uh, and then get a, another scanner system going to actually get this stuff written onto the screen. And then if you're curious as to how some of this stuff works, it's, um, it's a lot of tags is what it boils down to. Uh, these five rows here are pretty much what do a lot of the work. So we have the update cursor tags, uh, update cursor position, and then uh, setting uh, movement tags. So move cursor left, don't move cursor, move cursor right. Uh, and those tags are what tells the cursor when it can move. So if it encounters an end of file diamond block or a redstone block, it, it will do certain things. Uh, and then everything else just kind of happens around that. Other things also inherit uh, that functionality. For example, the um, the shifters, the back shifter, and just the regular shifter or the forward shifter. Uh, those two will also do the same thing. They'll get tags depending on what blocks they encounter. Uh, the difference is, of course, the those uh, armor stands are actually on loops. So these loops uh, basically go through a sequence. Uh, it's different per one, but we'll go through the um, the shifter first. So. Uh, first thing it does is it updates its tags, moves it, uh, and then uh, saves the current character, recalls the last character, and deletes the previous character. Uh, and then it terminates if it ends uh, if it encounters the end of string or a diamond block. Uh, and this, of course, being on a repeating block happens 20 times a second, uh, which is kind of slow. And if the um, if the screen uh, scanner portion of this is anything like that it's going to take a really long time to populate the screen especially when you start to get further down the line in the text uh, but that's okay um, easiest way to fix this is to simply unroll this we can actually take this entire line of command blocks and just repeat it as many times as we need but unrolling it like that is something that i plan on doing later on for the time being uh, for testing purposes just having it run on a single loop is plenty uh, but yeah after all of that we're actually heading in a decent direction here. We can wrap up some of these functions and start getting a scanner going to get some of the text on the screen. And after a little bit more finicking with some commands, we uh, now have a functional screen. Uh, if I were to go ahead and type something onto the keyboard, it actually appears on the screen. Now, there is a problem, of course, uh, because we're dealing with scanners, and these scanners have to go about at a rate of about 20 characters a second. Um, just by the nature of how we've got this set up, it takes a little bit of time to populate the screen. So if I were to actually add some more characters to the string, as the string gets longer and longer, it takes longer to refresh the screen. So it's a little bit of a detriment, uh, but this is a good trade-off because uh, Putting the string over here like this actually makes it a lot easier to add some of the functions I want to add. If I were, if I wanted to do some of this stuff on the screen, it would have been a lot more complicated. So it, it is a little bit of a problem, but it's not that big of a problem because, like I said, I can unroll this loop uh, and get it to go a lot faster. Uh, right now I'm leaving it as it is uh, because if I need to make changes to the loop, it's easier to do it to one loop than it is to do it with several. So I'm leaving it as it is, and as soon as I feel comfortable with how it works, I'll, I'll unroll it and make it faster. But for the time being, uh, this seems to be working just fine. Uh, and then I also got insert set up. Uh, we'll change the cursor position. I still need to add a cursor to the screen, but that's later on. But we'll change the cursor position. We'll change to, well, let's just show what it does right now. So if I add 
um, we'll add a number so we can clearly spot it. If I add a character right now, it'll actually insert it into the text. So if I add the number 8, you can see that the number 8 has been injected between the hello and the space. Uh, however, if I were to uh, change the insert mode to overwrite, and now we have uh, to add characters, it'll actually overwrite the existing characters. And if I continue doing that, uh, it'll just continue to overwrite characters all the way until the end of the string. Uh, until it gets to the end, uh, because we don't actually want it to overwrite the end of file character here. So once it reaches the end of file, it'll actually switch back over to the insert mode uh, until we back up and then it'll go back. So the logic of that, it was a little bit interesting to Im implement, but it wasn't too terribly difficult. It just required um, it just required adding a line for deciding that logic uh, in between the actual character detection and the character control. Uh, the other thing uh, that I added, which was kind of a trick, was uh, enter. You wouldn't think this would be difficult, but if I were to actually insert this into the text, uh, you can see that it actually uh, enters the string into the next line down. I'm not sure what happened there. That Oh, probably because I'm in the wrong mode. There we go. So uh, adding enters into the string don't actually get processed onto the screen even though they're uh, in the string. The screen scanner is set up to actually ignore them and simply just shift down every time it sees one. Uh, so that's something that I wanted to add and was able to do so. Uh, now there are of course a couple other features that I need to implement and some that I uh, should implement but I'm not going to. One of them of course is uh, text wrapping. So when the text gets too long for the screen, this is a 46 wide or 46 character wide screen. If we get a section of text without any enters for more than 46 blocks, uh, what should happen is it should wrap. The logic behind that is going to be really, really complicated and I really don't feel like doing that. So instead of doing that, I'm just going to have it run off to the end of the screen and stop until it encounters an enter and then wrap around. It'll basically be up to the user to format their text in a way that everything remains on screen. Uh, the other thing, of course, is auto-scrolling. Uh, as you know, when you uh, move the cursor around as you get further and further to the bottom, if you surpass the bottom, it's supposed to shift everything up. And so the way that I intend on dealing with that is there's actually two armor stands over here now. This one's the cursor, but this one is the top of screen pointer. And so the idea is that when we do the scanner, the top of screen pointer summons the scanner and it shoots off to the string, uh, to the end of the string. Uh, but when we want to shift a line down, uh, what we'll basically do is tell that pointer to move forward until it finds an enter. Uh, and then once it does that, refresh the screen and then populate the screen again. Uh, but of course, the logic for detecting when the uh, cursor is at the end of a string or even when it's at the beginning, because we'll want it to do the same thing when we scroll up. That'll be a bit of a trick, but I think it should be doable. And I think I have the scrolling mechanism figured out, or at least half of it. I actually don't have any means of detecting the cursor position and uh, when to scroll, but I at least have the mechanism for how to scroll set up. So if I... Uh, right now I've got a text with the vowels repeated three times and separated by enters. If I actually go ahead and scroll down uh, and then update the screen uh, you can see one of the lines disappear that's because we've actually scrolled down uh, and it's not that I deleted I can actually scroll back up and the line will return and um, the way this works this is actually done by this nice long chain of commands I think this is actually the longest one yet only by a few though uh, the way this works is it it's basically um, it's basically summoning another scanner at the location of the screen start. So, or the the top of screen uh, will summon a scanner. It will have the tag either to go forward or go backwards. Uh, and it will basically shoot off until it either sees uh, an enter, uh, the beginning of string, which is just the diamond block, or the end of string, which is the end of file block here. And the logic was actually really, really tricky because for going forward, we actually need to go forward one more in order to... Uh, skip the last enter because if we stop on the enter then that enter will actually get 
processed on the screen and we'll have an arbitrary blank line at the top. So we actually have to go forward by one. In fact, I can show you that if I were to go back and hit forward. Let's do it twice. That way we can show you going back as well. Uh, so it actually has to go forward by one uh, so that drawing the screen actually starts at this character. And then going back is actually a little bit more difficult because it needs to go back until it encounters a an enter. Uh, but once it does that, it needs to end up here, so it needs to go forward again. However, if it encounters the previous enter, it needs to ignore that. So it needs to run until it encounters the previous enter, skip it, and proceed to the next one, then go forward. Uh, and I can show you that too. Obviously, we can't watch it teleport, but it basically just... Uh, well, we might be able to see it if you look down down there, you'll see one armor stand gets summoned and it scans and then the other one gets teleported to it, just like that. And you can see that it ends up in front of the of the last enter. Uh, and like I said, the logic behind that was actually really, really complicated. It took me uh, more than a couple tries to figure this out. I actually ended up just giving up uh, trying to develop this with command blocks and I ended up just writing it in Python because, uh, let's be honest here, Developing software is a lot easier when you have a test suite available. But I ended up writing it in Python and then just doing my best to translate it into command blocks. And that's what this is the result of. Uh, it took two tries. Uh, I actually ended up messing up the translation of the first try uh, and then uh, got it right the second and this is the result. So we now actually have a means of moving the top of the screen up and down effectively simulating scrolling. Now we just need to figure out when we need to move that character. Uh, and that will be part of the cursor movement logic, I guess. And after a little bit of tweaking and a little bit more command blocks, I think I figured out the scrolling bit, or at least the other half of it, the part where we actually detect when we want to scroll. Uh, of course, we still aren't able to scroll the cursor up and down, but as we move it left to right, as it becomes out of the range of the screen, uh, the screen's positioning will adjust to uh, reorient the text in the screen. So right now we've got a simple test. We have all 26 letters uh, arranged in a string. Of course, this screen is only 25 characters tall, so we can't fit all 26 in at once. And you'll notice right now it's displaying B through Z. Uh, and if we were to actually go and look at the cursor, it is right in front of the screen stop. I actually have blocks here to act as a second pointer to these uh, to these pointers uh, because detecting these blocks is a lot easier than having the armor stands detect each other which was actually something I needed to do uh, but right now they're both sitting at the same position if I were to scroll the pointer back which would effectively be scrolling up the screens top will adjust appropriately because at that point the uh, the cursor is above the top of the screen and that's why I needed those blocks there, because that helps me detect that. Uh, and I can actually demonstrate that by just scrolling. And when that happens, the screen is going to update. And you'll see it starts at A then. So the top of the screen has successfully been adjusted. And uh, the same thing happens when I go the other way. Now, the other way was a little bit more tricky, uh, because we needed to... Uh, the, the end of, or rather I should say, how far... Uh, out from that uh, top of screen's armor stand is considered too far changes with how many enters there are in between. And so the only way to really tell if it's out of range is to simply update the screen. Now right now, scrolling the uh, pointer or the cursor doesn't actually update the screen, so that's something I'll have to change, especially when I get uh, a physical cursor on the screen to start displaying. That'll have to start happening. Um, but for the time being, it doesn't update it. So what I effectively have to do at this point to show you this is get the cursor all the way to the end, which maybe I should do that now. And with the cursor all the way to the end, if I were to go ahead and update the screen, uh, the screen updating process is going to take place and the scanner that goes through the string and translates the characters to the screen is eventually going to figure out that the cursor is outside of the range. So it's something that we can't really just... Uh, tell immediately we kind of have to figure it out by scanning. But I'll go ahead and show you that. Um, one of these is the update screen. So it'll update the screen, the scanner will eventually figure out that hey, it's out of range, and it will shift the top of screen 
and scan again, you saw it actually scan twice. So it's a little bit slow in that regard, uh, the fact that it has to scan twice in order to do that. Uh, but I figured as soon as I unroll these loops, that should speed up the process a little bit. It's still going to take some time, especially with larger text, but it should speed things along quite nicely. And then uh, the next thing I guess that I need to do is actually get a cursor up on the screen because I think we're ready for that. And the cursor itself, I was actually trying to figure out how I was going to do that. My initial thought was to use uh, blaze rods and armor stands, uh, kind of similar to Seth Bling just recently released a video on a 3D renderer using blaze rods and armor stands. I thought that would work pretty well. But the armor stand is rather thick and I don't have a whole lot of room to work around these letters. And uh, I really don't like working with armor stands more than I have to. So I actually ended up just retexturing some paintings. Uh, and these are, I, I mean, I'll show you, I'd show you them, but uh, they're retextured. Uh, they're basically just the Aztec and the kebab paintings uh, that have been completely turned transparent except for um, a line either on the side or on the bottom. And I have two because one of them is going to be the regular cursor. Uh, this is the one that's going to sit between the characters and indicate where characters are going to be inserted when you type. Uh, the other one is the overwrite, so it's going to sit underneath the character and indicate which character is going to be overwritten when typed. Uh, in fact, I can even show you what that looks like. Uh, so there's the insert uh, cursor. And let's see. And there's the um, the overwrite cursor. So they're not too bad. Uh, they actually look fairly decent. Of course, they're a little bit close to the letters, a little closer than I would like, especially with the M here. So I might readjust the textures for the letters just to make it a little bit more roomy. Uh, but I might not. It actually looks like it might be just fine. Um, maybe maybe shift it over to the right just a little bit. Though this M is already pretty close to the edge. In fact, if I were to grab a block that we can contrast against. Uh, we've only got two pixels to work with on, on the M on the other side. So that one's already as close as it can possibly get. So I might just leave it. Uh, I might experiment with it just to see how it looks, but nonetheless, uh, cosmetics aside, the next bit is going to be getting this cursor to actually start appearing on the screen. And we now have cursors, or a cursor, I should say, on the physical screen. And it really wasn't that difficult to incorporate this, all the infrastructure for it was already there with everything else. So I really just had to add two commands to the screen scanner. And basically all that it is is as the screen scanner moves across the string and moves characters onto the screen, it looks for the physical cursor armor stand and places a cursor on the screen. Uh, the only trick was the logic for when that cursor needs to be placed, because obviously we don't want it placed over the edge, nor do we want it placed on the bottom, so uh, we needed... Uh, there is one final check that just checks to see if uh, this, the cursor can be placed on the screen, but once the uh, that logic passes, and the cursor on the string is found. The cursor on the screen, oh boy, it's getting hard to keep that straight, is uh, placed on the screen. And uh, there's actually two cursors. So we have the insert cursor and the uh, overwrite. I'm really not certain if there's an official term for these two cursors, but this is the one where characters are overwritten, and this is the one where characters are inserted, and the line kind of tells you where characters will be placed. So if I place a, another character, it'll be placed right there and the cursor gets shifted. Likewise with backspacing. And then you'll notice that the screen is actually being updated as I not only swap with uh, insert and uh, not insert, but as well as uh, cursor position. So I can actually move uh, the cursor and the screen updates accordingly. That was kind of a necessity because the cursor's placement is done by the screen scanner, so I have to update the screen every time I move the cursor in any way. Uh, so it, again, that also didn't take too much effort. I basically just had to place a trigger uh, update screen command block everywhere uh, that was needed. So with the cursor movements and the insert. Uh, again, it uh, was fairly easy to do just because all the infrastructure was there. Uh, but this does raise a problem. Every time we write a character, move the cursor, anything like that, the whole screen has to be updated. So this is another reason why we need to unroll those loops just to try and speed things along. I can't imagine I'll get too big of a speed boost, but I figured if I can get 
the loop to happen maybe 20 or 30 times, that should help tremendously. Uh, but the next thing on the list is adding the vertical cursor movement, which will be a little bit of a trick if I wanted to emulate real life things. I'm still trying to work out the logic because uh, obviously moving from the beginning of one line down to the next is pretty easy. I just jump to the next start or, or the next enter. But if I'm over here uh, and I want to move down, I basically need to move that many characters past the next start, which means that's something I'll have to count. And it gets even more tricky if the string below is shorter, because instead of going straight down, it needs to go back as well. So there's a little bit of logic to that. I'll have to work that out, but that's the next step. Otherwise, I think we're nearing completion here. Uh, the next bit, of course, like I said, is just the vertical cursor movement, but there's also going to be the um, these select functions, which will actually allow me to select portions of the string, and my hopes is to use that to do bulk removal, so hitting backspace to clear it out, uh, as well as copying and pasting, uh, but we're still, I, I still need to work out all that stuff. But for the time being, we're just going to get the vertical cursor movement working. You know what? Change of plan. Uh, getting the up and down movement to work, uh, the logic behind that is going to be way too complicated. Uh, initially, I was going to have something of a, a real uh, cursor up-down movement type, where you have um, the cursor will basically mo move straight down uh, so long as that space is available, and then it'll move back if it's not, and then move forward if it is. Uh, but that ended up being really, really complicated. The logic for that was really uh, complicated, even in a high-level language. Uh, making it with command blocks would have been a pain, so... I then decided to just um, move the cursor to the front of the line every time we moved up and down. That still had its own fair share of issues because uh, recall the screen uh, scanning logic actually uh, looks for the cursor when updating. And so if we're moving, you know, dozens or even hundreds of blocks forward, uh, that screen refresh logic may not actually be tripped in. So moving it down might actually not update the screen. So I have basically just skipped it altogether. Uh, I may add that in the future, but for the sake of time, we're just going to skip it. Uh, but I did get some other features figured out. Uh, for example, we now have uh, save slots. So you can see over here we actually have uh, 10 save slots that we can work with. And you can save and recall. So if I uh, load from slot 10, uh, we get what was stored in there. Uh, so that allows us to uh, save our work up to 10 different files. Initially, I was going to have sort of a command-like structure where this space all the way to the back would have been reserved for programs, and then I could actually name them and save them, load them using a command. That's actually what the escape was for. Uh, the escape was for backing out of the text and loading into or running the uh, command processor, I guess. Uh, but again, for the sake of time, we're just going to go with a standard save and load button sequence. Uh, and then also to save on space, there's only 10 of them. But that should still be sufficient for what we need to do. Uh, it's not like it um, it really needed to have uh, a command type structure. But I, I kept the escape button in here anyway. I might use it for something later on, but for the time being, it's basically just a useless button. And uh, the last thing that, I, uh, that I've that i added, uh, and this is only half added, but I do actually have a select going on. So if I move the cursor with the select on, uh, we can see we actually have like this selection uh, cursor going on here, which is just some squiggly lines above and below the selection. So the, um, the intention was to actually have it go both ways, so if I were to actually... Uh, undo the selection, then redo it, and then go back. Uh, the idea was to have it go both ways, so either in front of or behind the cursor, but there is that issue uh, where the cursor and the selection uh, painting kind of overlap, and then it kind of pops off. So that's a little bit of, a, of an issue. I could fix it, but modifying these command blocks is getting more and more difficult as I add features, so I'm probably just going to leave it and instead just say um, don't select backwards. If you're going to select, move forwards only. <laughs> so 
Uh, but that's just a selection logic, of course. I still don't have a clipboard or anything like that. Uh, no means of copying or pasting. Uh, I do have a space for a clipboard. You have the second set of pillars here. Uh, this is where the clipboard will go. This may be a little bit overkill, but uh, that's fine. I think um, I think there should be more than enough space for whatever it is we intend on copying and pasting. Uh, but the next step, I guess, uh, and this will probably be the last feature that I add before I finish off the video, is uh, just taking whatever I have selected and copying it over to the clipboard and then figuring out a way of pasting it into the text. So I have gotten the pasting mechanism to work, sort of. Uh, if you'll notice here, uh, it basically works the same way as the copying, just in the other direction. So we have a, a setup, sort of a summoning line, and then an actual loop that runs. Uh, but if I were to actually paste it right now, I've got um, just a random uh, excerpt from the the 10th slot stored in the clipboard and we're just gonna paste it at the beginning of the of the string if I go ahead and paste that you'll notice that uh, well we get some really weird results uh, if I go ahead and load that back uh, instead of letting this run on a 20 Hertz loop instead if we were to change it to an impulse uh, and then manually paste it or manually tick it, I should say. And it'll take a moment or two, but eventually the screen will update. And we get the correct string out. So what's going on here is uh, every time we paste, what we're actually doing is we're taking the character from the clipboard uh, and we're inserting it into the string as if we were loading a character from the keyboard. Now, loading a character from the keyboard or inserting like that works at typing speeds. It does not work very well at 20 hertz or 20 uh, inserts a second. So, uh, we are at a little bit of an impasse here. And we have two solutions. Uh, option one is we can slow this down. Or option two is we can start the unrolling process. And let's see here. One of these is the insert character, so character shifter. Uh, the other option is to unroll, or begin the unrolling process for the sh uh, character shifter uh, loop there. And what that will do is uh, basically speed up the shifting process so that this has enough time to run at 20 cycles a second. Uh, either way, uh, unrolling this particular loop will not be feasible. I don't think we can uh, get this to run more than 20 times a second uh, without having some sort of catastrophic failure like we just saw there. So I think I'm going to start by trying uh, to unroll this first and then run this at 20 cycles a second. If that doesn't work, we'll just put this on the clock. Okay, so I took the character shifter sequence here and I just unrolled it three times here. So now we have three copies of the same loop. And that seemed to have done the trick. If I actually go ahead and paste it in, we can see that uh, well, it's able to do it quite successfully. So, all that's left now is just to uh, unroll some of the loops that I still can unroll and try and speed this thing up a little bit. Uh, of course, I did mention that uh, there's no up or down scroll, and actually the more I think about it, uh, the more I think it might be possible to actually get the scroll up and scroll down to work, at, at the very least moving to the beginning of the line. Maybe not vertical movement, but getting to the beginning of the line should work just fine. Uh, and that's because, uh, obviously, um, we don't actually do any uh, checking as to whether or not the cursor passed the the screen top or the screen range uh, when we're actually moving it. It's actually when we re-render the screen that we check it. So, I don't know about moving up, but moving down, we should be able to at least uh, be able to move the cursor down and then update the screen and then check to see if it's within range. So, I think I might be able to implement that but uh, we shall see. And after a little bit of finicking, I actually managed to get up and down scrolling working. Now, like I said before, it's not perfect. I mean, we can't completely scroll vertically up and down, so if I actually go in a couple characters and scroll down, you see it just moves it to the beginning of the line. But it does scroll, so that actually helps tremendously with editing text. Just the fact that you can move up and down lines like that just makes a huge difference. Uh, but I also completed the unrolling process for everything. 
So now it's working as fast as it possibly can. I basically just unrolled all the loops 20 times, uh, so that speeds things up quite drastically. The only loops that I haven't unrolled is the um, copying and pasting loops, uh, and that's just because those actually rely on uh, shifters and scanners for the screen and the string, and so having I physically cannot run those more than uh, once per tick because... Uh, they actually trigger a lot of these other command blocks, and you can't trigger them more than once per tick. So uh, those are running as fast as they can. Everything else is running 20 times faster than that. And as a result, it ends up moving quite rapidly. Uh, in fact, if I were to paste, we can see just how quickly that operates. So, you know, it takes about a second, but it's still pretty fast. Uh, updating the entire screen takes about two-ish seconds, maybe a little less. Not the fastest, but definitely not slow either. Um, otherwise, I think that's pretty much all the features that I want to add to this. I know I said I wanted to do bulk backspacing. I don't really think that it's necessary. It's um, not really a feature that I want to spend the time to add, especially considering that this uh, portion alone has already taken a little under a month to make. So... I'm going to leave that feature out, otherwise all the other features that make this a somewhat viable text editor is already in place. Uh, the next step, of course, uh, in this whole process is um, actually creating the parser for code. Uh, and the first pr uh, step in that process is creating the lexer, actually taking uh, the strings of characters and turning it into tokens. But that we'll have to save for the next video. So thank you all for watching. If you want to check some of this stuff out yourself, I will be posting this world on a Planet Minecraft page, which I will be updating every time I post a new video on this subject. Uh, and so if you want to check that out for yourself, feel free to visit the page. Go ahead and download. And I will see you guys in the next video where we will start on the Lexer. I'll see you then.